Parenting Junkie. Hi, and welcome back to The Parenting Junkie, the place to go to love parenting and for parenting from love. I want to tell you guys about an exploration that we had in our unschooling life recently with my two young children. So this is like a case study of life learning, how it might work on any given topic. And this particular one is dinosaurs. And that happened because we were gifted a pack of dinosaur flashcards that my kids were really excited by and inspired by. So that was what inspired this whole kind of spiral into their learning process about dinosaurs, which kind of started with a creative exploration. And this is uh, really, um, it points to how intrinsically motivated they were. They got out the female and they started to build their own dinosaurs, looking at the flashcards and copying the shapes that they saw. Um, and they, uh, of course, were learning really about all the different details that go into various dinosaur species. And... Um, and this was a form of self-expression. Of self-expression, They were personally invested and intrinsically motivated. And this gave them authorship over their learning experience. So rather than going out and buying a bunch of dinosaur toys, which I might have done, in this case I didn't have to because my kids were creating their own toys, their eggs nests, their, bur their flying dinosaurs, etc. And of course, because they were doing this, they were developing the va vocabulary that goes along with it, learning what horns were, what frills were, what the crest is. Um, which dinosaurs come in which sizes and which colors and textures and details like that. Now, when you make your own toys, um, it's kind of like when adults make their own IKEA furniture, you're much more invested in them and therefore much more likely to really play with them uh, for long periods of time, which is definitely what happened in this case and is continuing to happen. Um, the toys that they've made themselves, these dinosaurs, they play with endlessly, uh, which is really beautiful to watch. And because there's no um, schedule imposed by classes, by other children, by um, pickup times, etc., um, they can do this for as long as they need to. Um, and they can explore dinosaurs in whatever ways they need to for as long as they need to, which is, of course, a huge privilege and one that we're very uh, grateful to have. But um, one of the ways that this has manifested is also in the books that they've chosen at the library. So we'll go to the library and they will choose a dinosaur themed books, whether or not they actually teach them uh, scientifically about dinosaurs. Uh, those are the themes uh, that they're mostly interested in over the past couple of months. And of course, when a child chooses their own books uh, to read and their own theme to explore, they're going to be much more invested in it and they're going to be um, motivated to pick up a book and sit down and look look at it by themselves for a while for example well not every kid but many kids will um, and that's the beauty of following their lead on which topic they want to learn so far from them not learning anything and sitting home all day doing nothing it's more about me as a parent being able to facilitate and support their areas of interest and kind of keep up with them so that i can provide the materials and experiences that will allow them to learn the things that they need to learn right now Another way that they explored dinosaurs, for example, was in the TV shows that they watched recently. So some uh, National Geographics and some um, scientific shows like Walking with Dinosaurs, but also this great cartoon called Dinosaur Train on Amazon Prime, which is a really gentle, nonviolent cartoon, which gives them a lot of information about dinosaurs and that they really enjoyed uh, watching. So that worked well. Another thing that we've been really lucky in being able to provide them is trips to natural history museums and um, this one, for example, where they could climb on the dinosaur sculptures and Field Station Dinosaur in New Jersey, which is like a life-size dinosaur zoo where they have 18 different animatronic dinosaurs that actually move and make noises and you can really learn a lot about the dinosaurs there, which is really, really interesting were able to do a fossil dig where they got to use real tools to dig real fossils out of the dirt, which was another great experience. So you can see how uh, with unschooling, you just kind of follow this lead. And I can only really tell you about this quote unquote unit in retrospect. Now looking back, I see, oh, we've just kind of completed a unit about dinosaurs, if you like. Um, but really, it's just about naturally following um, what interests us and what is available in our environment right now. If you want more from me on mindful parenting, head on over to theparentingjunkie.com and sign up for email updates. Keep on loving parenting and parenting from love because your kids need you almost as much as you need them. Bye. The
Parenting Junkie. Sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation, and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the, uh, ConsciousResistance.com and TheSeasOfLiberty.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT NoGov license. This allows for reuse for people other than governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for that at BIPCOT.org. So today we have Avital Shriver, Le- Levy, Levy, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> coming, you got it. Coming in uh, close by to me uh, in New York as well, which is very uh, rare for my guests. Um, <laughs> I have guests like from all over the world. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, uh, I met her uh, recently at uh, this homeschooling uh, little farm, and it was really awesome, and we connected, and so I'm like, you, I got to get you on my show. So, <laughs> uh, so Avital is an unschooling mom of three. She's a vlogger at the, theparentingjunkie.com. And um, and she also does mindful parent. She's a mindful parenting coach. You can get lessons from her for that. And she also uh, is is working on a course right now called How to Set Empathic Limits. So we're gonna learn more about that. And you can find her her stuff on theparentingjunkie.com dot com and on Facebook, the Parenting Junkie. No spaces. Well, hopefully she'll change that. But for now, it's no spaces. Um, and then YouTube. It's is it the Parenting Junkie on YouTube? Yep, I yeah. believe so. And Twitter, Instagram, The Parenting Junkie, Pinterest, Parenting Junkie, um, and uh, Instagram is the underscore parenting underscore junkie. So we'll talk about you know um, how she came to unschooling and peaceful parenting, and what Parenting Junkie is all about, what she talks about on that channel, and uh, and also her course uh, that she's working on now. I think that's that's a lot uh, a lot of great advice uh, to share with that. So, so Avital, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Yeah, so we connected uh, a couple of months ago, and it was really awesome. You know, I don't often meet, you know, first of all, I don't often meet unschoolers and people who advocate peaceful parenting, and then I don't, even less often do I meet uh, people who are content creators with a YouTube channel, and so when I heard that, I'm like, what? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we talked, and uh and things happened, and then I'm like, "All right, come on my show." So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I checked out a couple of your videos. Um, the uh, I think it was uh, "Why I Want to Unschool," and then a bunch of your latest videos. Really awesome stuff. I love it. Um, your I think your your tagline at the end is uh, is uh, you know they need wait 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 parenting with wait love how to love keep parenting. on loving parenting. Oh, <laughs> like, keep, yeah, keep on loving parenting and parenting from love. And then the other one is. Uh, because your children need you almost as much as you need them, right? Correct. Okay, cool. Nice to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. But uh, but yeah. So so please um, go into a little bit about your your history about how you came into the philosophy of peaceful parenting and why you uh, are attracted to the idea of unschooling. Sure. Um, yeah. So I kind of um, grew into the ideas of peaceful parenting and I have a long way yet to grow in uh, implementing uh, the things that I preach basically. Um, But uh, when I first was thinking about becoming a parent, it really seemed like a not super fun job. Everyone seemed like they were kind of suffering (laughs) as parents. Do you know what I mean? Like now I get it now that I have three kids, I really, really get it. But parents just always seem so tired and angry and like just wanting to get their kids away from them. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what for? Forget it. I'm not going to have kids. Um, And then when I decided that I, I would want children, I realized that it's got to be, there's got to be something a little bit different about it. It can't just be constantly this inner struggle of, of, of control. And now I know, now I know uh, to pinpoint what, what that feeling was, a feeling of out of control and needing to grasp at that control the whole time. And so I started reading a lot, uh, reading a lot about parenting and I was very lucky to stumble across the right, um, the right blogs and the right, um, 
thought leaders, um, people like Janet Lansbury of Rye, Dr. Laura Markham of Peaceful Parenting, Alfie Cohn of Unconditional Parenting, Dr. Shafali Tabari of The Conscious Parent, um, Dr. Peter Gray, uh, all these uh, different writers who, um, you know, I kind of devoured their stuff. I was just like, oh my God, you know, and my mind was just being blown. Like one myth after the other was just mm -hmm. disintegrating before my eyes about what it means to be a parent and what the dynamic is between parent and child. Um, and yeah, and that was, that was how, that was how I started and that's how I'm continuing. I, I continue to educate myself on a regular basis. I continue to fail miserably at a lot of my goals. Um, but that's how we learn, right? <laughs> so basically you're saying, you're, basically what you're saying is because you read all these books, now you're a perfect parent? <laughs> <Just kidding>. Exactly. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it down. Yeah. <laughs> I was just kidding. Yeah, we were talking about this before, how, how it's funny that we get criticized a lot because it's like, what do you think you know? You think you know more than the teacher? Like, how can you teach better than somebody who got a master's degree and, and you know, teaches in schools, right? You know, what do you think? You're so arrogant. You think you know everything? <laughs> and, and the whole idea to me is that the irony is that, no, actually, I'm humble enough to recognize that, no, I don't know everything. And I don't think anyone knows everything that, uh, that, uh, that you know, what a child should know. And, and nor, nor should they because every child is different. Every child has different interests and needs and curiosities. And so what's good and right for one child is not good and right for another child. So there's no way that you can standardize that or learning. There's no way. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that you can standardize learning. Um, oh, you can just at a huge cost. Well, yeah. In, yeah, in, 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 yeah, you can, you can, yeah, right. You, uh, you destroy the potential of what might have been by, um, you know, telling them that this is what you need to learn. This is what you need to memorize for the test. And yeah, you're right. It does have a huge, huge psychological cost. I mean, I, 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 I can see going so far as saying that, that submitting your child to, to government school for 12 years is akin to child abuse, right? Because it is in, wow. in, um, how you say, uh, it, it's it's not it's not left the choice is not left to the child you know it's like it's like you know consensual lovemaking is called love non consensual lovemaking is called rape right now what is it with the brain and with consensual learning learning what you actually want to learn and then learning what you don't want to learn and that you're forced to learn <laughs> you know what is that called yeah. what you know and the only thing I can think of is indoctrination because it's not learning. Because learning is voluntary. You learn something because you want to learn it, not because somebody told you to learn it. Right. I hear that. Um, I hear that. And I've, you know, I've heard schools called you know, prisons, only that in prisons, um, people get to choose what they do with their time. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So, you know, and, um, and also... People who are in prisons have usually done something wrong. Right, um, right. But you know what? I think that that is all valid. And when I read those ideas it, uh, by you know writers like Alfie Cohn, for example, or John Holt, um, I connect to them. But I would like to advocate for unschooling for the love of unschooling. Right. Good. Um, yeah. For the love of, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I, um, I'm very conscious because everybody around me, all my friends and family, send mm -hmm. their kids to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm very conscious of as an unschooler, and this is kind of a message that I sometimes give to un other unschoolers, is I'm very conscious of not alienating right. yeah. school-going children because I think that there will be some of us, like you and I, right. who, at least for the time being, are comfortable saying, I'm, I'm opting out. I'm, I'm really going the, you know, quote-unquote, radical route, <laughs> and I'm, I'm experimenting, if you like, on my own family, of course, this isn't the experiment, right? <laughs> School is really the experiment. But, right, exactly. <laughs> right? Um, so some of us are going to be comfortable going that, that route and some of us are going to have the privilege of doing that and others are not. And therefore, I'm, my hope is that these elements of child-led learning, of respect for a child's uh, innate motivations, etc., is going to trickle through, hopefully, to some kind of revolutionized um, do I call it school? I don't know. Uh, system mm. um, that that all children can benefit from. That's my that you know. That's I think the real hope. So I think that the hope is that like unschoolers will you know sh lead this process from the front, 
but that you know the masses of children who are being indoctrinated if you like will will hopefully get some of that get in on some of that too and i think mm. one of the most amazing ways that's happening is through the, the democratic school system who you know these schools have proven their worth even in the standardized measurements which is what most people do care about mm. When you say uh, the democratic schools, you mean like the Sudbury Valley School, like those kinds of exactly, yeah, um, exactly. Where, where the yeah. where the students have the ability to you know influence like rules and have decision making or, or talk about yeah, what, if if, other, it's if, if there's a an unschool right. school, yeah. you know that's what it is. There's complete freedom, um, and learning is uh, is self you know self directed right. completely. Um, Are you familiar with Brett Vanat? And the the uh, school yeah. sucks. The school sucks podcast. He he's been run, he's running that. He's been running that for years. Um, he really done an awesome job. And I, met, I met him once. I have I've interviewed him once. Really awesome guy. But one thing he said was that um, one misnomer that maybe we should stop using is using the word school because every time somebody hears that word, they immediately think in a building, desks and chairs, books, right. quiet, lis- listening to a teacher. So when you're like, yeah. I, I do homeschooling, you're like, wait, wait. So they sit in a desk right. and a chair so you the at teacher? home, <laughs> right, exactly. you know? And so it's a confusing term. So he says, maybe we should make it, we, we should say something like home education or life-led mm-hmm. learning or passion-led life learning, learning, which is what I, right. which is what I like to tell people. Um, and I, I also stumbled upon this, this podcast. I don't know if you heard about it uh, by Amy Childs. You heard of her? She she has this podcast called The Unschooling Life, uh, yes. And and she uh, she also, she interviewed a, a big uh, personality in the unschooling world. I think Sandra Dodd. You familiar? I don't know if she wrote any yeah. books, but she's pretty pretty big. What's well, his name? Doing a bell, but I I probably just come across it in my feed. I get yeah. a lot of unschooling stuff in my Facebook. Yeah. So so she um one thing that that she was talking about in one episode was that the idea of uh, <laughs> uh learn nothing holiday <laughs> or learn nothing day, and so it's kind mm-hmm. of a joke in that if you tell. Uh, a parent with a child in in public school, and then and the, and the child, okay, we're gonna do learn nothing day. You know, the child is like, "Wee, yay, I'm so happy!" And then the right. mother, the parents, like petrified, like, "What? How can you do that? That's horrible! Every day you need to be going to school, learning something." But and so and so and so when you tell that to an unschooling mother or child, uh, they're like, "That's so stupid! What are you talking about? We learn every day. How can you?" How right. can you not it's, not learn one day? That's impossible. And 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 they're saying that like even if you uh you know that like one 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 unschooling mother is telling telling the child she's like she's like um what if I um lock you in a room and turn off the lights and don't give you anything to do she's like she's like I'm still gonna learn that I don't like to be locked in a room <laughs> with the lights <laughs> so I can I'm always learning this is impossible yeah yeah. <laughs> what do you, what do you think? Well, that's exactly. I mean, that really points out the the. The difference in in definition, really, I guess, right, in how we think about what what does it mean to be. I'm just reading Alfico's book. What does it mean to be well educated, mm. right? What does it mean to be well educated? Does it mean that there is a pre pre determined list of facts and figures that you are able to you know produce uh, on a test? Is mm. that what it means to be well educated? Um, and what does learning mean? Also, I think really critical. Yeah. Uh, again, is it just about remembering? somewhat random you know list of uh, list of facts and figures um or, or is there a much deeper process that that has a lot more meaning um for our kids my you know i'm i'm betting on number two yeah i think it's completely arbitrary like you know just think about all the the bits of information in history right that have been mm-hmm. created and stumbled upon by scientists and inventors and entrepreneurs and people who are just like intelligent and then they pick this little sliver of information and tell all the kids this is what you need to learn to be a successful person in life yeah (laughs) and my question is how do you know that are you are you a fortune teller do you know the future do you know what the world will be like in 20 years when they're of age where they have to start working no obviously you don't so why would you believe a bureaucrat who thinks that they know what your child needs to learn 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. It's very random. I, I, think, I, I think the world probably doesn't necessarily even know the information that our, children is, are, that our children are going to need to acquire for success in the future. Like, we don't have that information yet. No, we don't. You know? No. 
uh, one example so, I, I like to give. I, remember I was talking to um, uh, this woman who sends her kids to school, and when I talk to people who send their kids to school, you know, I, I don't, I don't. I, I try to be understanding, you know, like nonviolent communication. Like I try to be gentle in the way I talk about things, yeah. and uh, and I give examples, you know, analogies, and and so one analogy I like to give is imagine that you're living, uh, uh, you know, a family's living in the um, the turn of the 20th century, beginning of the 19, 1900s, and yeah. and you know the car was just being developed and becoming more mainstream, and and the child's like, you know, I want to learn how to drive a car, and then the right. parents like, no. You have to learn how to ride a horse because my right. parent rode horses, their parents rode horses, <laughs> everybody rode horses. You need right. to learn how to and like, but no, now we have cars. <laughs> so, so like you said, um, there's no way that we can prepare our kids for a future that has not that, that we have no idea about because we have no idea what's going to look like, you know. Uh, and things right. are constantly going obsolete, changing, you know, transforming, and so allowing children to investigate and and um, you know, look up and be curious about different things. That's what will be relevant to their future. We have no idea will be relevant to their future, but what they're curious about most likely will be relevant to their future. Yeah, I, I agree. And also, you know, I think that also touches upon the issue of diversity because you were mentioning standardization beforehand. Um, it's very frightening to think of a world where everybody holds the exact same set of cards and, you know, they just, you know, all the analogies are so cliche to to a factory, but mm -hmm. that is that really is how how it, yeah. how it's working in many schools. Right. I don't I don't think in all. I think there are plenty of schools that develop some creativity that you know that have a little bit more personal choice and personal accountability, or that put an effort on uh, you know an emphasis on um, social and emotional skills. But by and large, the system especially in the US and especially the public school system is going in the direction of further and further standardization and making sure that a kid in Korea and a kid in Texas uh, come out at 18 with the exact same set of skills and the exact same set of of facts which you know that's scary because because when when you look at a healthy town a healthy community, a healthy global community, we know that we thrive on diversity. We know that we thrive on lots of different people working mm -hmm. together in collaboration with lots of different skill sets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if the system is dampening that so much so that everybody comes out with the same abilities, then, you know, that that's worrying. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and I think one major... One major thing that's um, that's undermining the idea of uh, of government schooling is uh, the internet, because um, no longer can you really control the free flow of information when it's so expansive, so lightning fast. You can look up anything. You know, yeah. it's like before the internet. How would you get information, right? You know, from your teacher from school, maybe from the library. I don't know. You ask your grandparents. <laughs> you read a book, right. right? But now you got YouTube, you got Wikipedia, and you got you know Google. And so I think that in itself is already rendering uh, government school obsolete. All right? It's a dinosaur institution. It's 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 decadent. <laughs> it's outdated. Right. You know, it is destined to die. There is no way around it. And I think the more um, you know, the kids growing up now that have never experienced life without the internet, they're seeing it's kind of obvious that like all this stuff I can learn on the internet. Why do I have to need to go to this place where this dry, right. uh, you know, this teacher is de teaching me some dry, useless facts right. and figures? Like, what's right. the purpose? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I was in school, that wasn't the Internet wasn't around. So that was how you learn. Um, but even yeah, I mean, even <laughs> I would say that there were so many other ways of learning. But yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, um, well, well let, let me ask you. Let me ask you on this topic, because um, yeah. I know you did a video on screen time. So so what's mm -hmm. so so can you share your view on uh, on, uh, you know, using the internet or computers or electronic devices for the purposes of learning and, and how you incorporate that with your kids. I mean, they're not, I guess your, your kids are not like, you know, how old is your oldest? Four or five? My oldest is turning five. five. He's still, he's still young. Um, yeah, I think it's an, a completely indispensable tool. It's, it's integrated into life, uh, especially unschooling life. There's no, uh, there's no separation, I think, between technology and learning uh, for, for many unschoolers. Um, 
I hope that we develop a healthy relationship with the screen. I myself am addicted to a screen, I think. I think we all are. You know, it's very hard for me to go two hours without checking my email, without just randomly looking again and again at things as if suddenly it's going to, you know, be very exciting. Um, (laughs) You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to get a message. I must look at this thing. It might bing. Something might happen. so yeah, so I I, I, I have to kick uh, I have to kick that habit because I do think that I really want my kids to grow up with long stretches of time in nature and with real people and connecting face to face and real hands on play. Um, you know, I'm I'm grateful that they at the moment are deep in the habit of you know play of real real immersive play that can go on for hours and that. Um, really grabs their creativity and their curiosity and we do a lot of artwork and we do a lot of um crafting and reading and that kind of thing um so lots of things without the screen at the moment and hopefully that will continue um but i think the screen is a friend uh, a very very good friend to unschoolers and um and i fully intend to you know uh give my kids hopefully at, at some point unlimited access at the moment that doesn't work for us mm. um i do think that we have to be vigilant as parents as to what content our kids are are um, consuming i'm not a whole life unschooler i don't think that there should be no boundaries or limits i don't think a six-year-old should be allowed to stumble upon porn or <laughs> incredibly violent images and mm. that's you know that's their right because they should have access to all information i think that it's our job as parents to protect them from that mm-hmm. um i also really think and research backs me up on this is that when you experience violence or something through a screen, your brain, uh, you know, our hunter-gatherer brain processes it as if it's reality. Um, And I think that, especially for young children, the differentiation between the screen and reality is so blurred that I do, I am very conscious about too much violence or unkind behavior because I think that you get really desensitized from that. I know that Peter Gray argues differently and I so respect him and have a huge parenting crush on him. Um, But (laughs) when it comes to um, screens, I just can't buy it. Like I don't buy that you can sit there shooting a gun at someone and watching them, you know, die and get pleasure from that kind of violent scene. And that doesn't do anything to your, to your desensitization. I don't buy it uh, at the moment. Maybe I'll be convinced otherwise. Um, so yeah, I think that we have to be careful. I don't want my kids in front of SpongeBob six hours a day. That's a problem for me. I think that that's for me, for me, that would be negligence. Um, but yeah, but on the other hand, whenever my kid has a question, I say, let's go look it up. And I don't, I'm not teaching him to use an encyclopedia. I'm teaching him to look it up on the web. Um, so you're saying, so, so you're saying you're not a, a closet Counter-Strike or Halo player? <laughs> Just kidding. Just <laughs> well, if I was, I wouldn't be telling you that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting because you know this technology is new; it's developing. You know, we don't have experience with it. We're learning it, and you know, like we, you know, when when I was young, I don't know how much TV you watched, but I did watch some TV, and I enjoyed it. And then I, I know, I had little video games when I when it came out, and but I was not; it didn't consume me, right? Like I had other interests. I had, you know, I love chess and piano, and philosophy and music, and and. Yeah. Um, and learning about different things, and so it was just one way to relax. Um, and uh, you know, different you know, kids respond to these things in different ways. Some, I guess, you know, some kids have what you, you know we would say is addictive personalities can't um, you know limit themselves in certain things. But but then again, you know, like uh, it, it's like hmm, how do you say this? It's like it, like even as a lot of adults, some adults who are like have addictive personalities, like sure. I mean, wh- what do you what do you do with them? Like that's what they want to do. That's what that's what makes them happy. That's what makes them happy. You know, I mean, I, I accept mm-hmm. that as as uh, as children, you know, we we're responsible for our kids, right? And and every yeah. parent draws the line differently, right? Like how how much do you interfere with your child's life? Like like you know, when I talk about peaceful parenting and and this kind of stuff, a lot of parents have this idea that like. You know, I think what you said, like the radical person, just, you know, let your kid yeah. do whatever <laughs> right. as long as they don't kill themselves to walk off a cliff. Let them do whatever. And um, right. and I wouldn't say that I do that. But I, what I tell people is I don't tell people how to act. I don't tell people I don't like to tell people what to do. I don't I don't like to give people, you know, this is the manual that will explain every single thing that you need to do in every single situation. Yeah. No, what I give to people is principles 
and you mm-hmm. apply those principles to your own specific situation, right? Your mm-hmm. specific and unique children, and you make the decision when to not abide by those principles and when to break right. them. And it's different for everybody, right? And so it's completely fine when you say that, you know, you read these these authors and you agree with them on this, but you don't agree with them on that. That's great, right. you know, because to me, that signifies that you're not just blindly believing these people because they wrote it down. Like you're believing it because you in your heart really understand it. And you're like, I like this, but I don't like this, right? So I think that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the essence of, of uh, mindful parenting, right? Is, uh, is being a little bit deliberate and intentional about our choices wherever we can be. Um, so gathering the information, uh, getting inspired by, by these resources that we have, um, and then, and then uh, really listening to our own intuition as well. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's I, I try to practice what I preach. Don't always manage, but I try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's the other thing. You know, I think we, um, you know, I think I think we really try to be consistent. You know, that's uh, you know, that's why I, uh, you know, apply what I with parenting. I, I apply it to people, and I apply it mm-hmm. to businesses, and I apply it to everything. You know, you, you yeah. treat, treat people with respect because that's how you like to be treated. Um, mm-hmm. The golden rule, but also a, a friend of mine was telling me that that that's not always accurate because you know what if a masochist likes to be likes to be tortured then <laughs> right. so so maybe he says there's something called the silver rule. I don't know if you heard of this, but don't mm-hmm. don't don't treat others the way you don't want to be treated. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. How about treat others the way they want to be treated? But how do you know? That's the thing. How do you know how others want to be treated? Uh, like like yeah. be, 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 well yeah <laughs> hi, hi how you doing how do you want to be treated I don't know. yeah exactly <laughs> how okay. would you like to be treated what would feel good to you today <laughs> yeah, and then, then, to, and then tomorrow on. tomorrow i'm gonna ask you again <laughs> but um but yeah so so uh you know the way I, I i explain you know how i parent is um you know i like to um I, I I want my relationship to be like a friend, like a peer, right? And mm-hmm. um and not like not like, you know, superior or inferior or, you mm-hmm. know, authority and subject. You know, I don't want mm-hmm. that because I already recognize that as as adults we are already, you know, older, stronger and bigger, right? And we already have this advantage over our kids who by the yeah. way have not chosen to be our children right we chose to be parents they didn't choose to be our children right. so they have no choice in the matter we're the ones right. with the obligation the acquired obligation therefore it's right. it's up to us it's our duty to give them a childhood such that if they did have a choice between other parents they would willingly choose us <laughs> so that's how that's, that's kind great. of encapsulates how i how i like to parent <laughs> I think that's beautiful. And I think that it's, um, I love that you say that you want to be your kid's friend. I just saw this very angry YouTube mom saying, I am not your friend. I am your parent. Right. Um, and I think right. it was first Alfie Kohn who, who pointed out in one of his books, I forget which, where he was saying, probably unconditional parenting, where he said um, this, this uh, dualistic approach to friend and parent you know, either you're, I'm your friend or I'm your parent, as if you could be an effective parent without being a friend, <laughs> you know, and I think it was such a great point, you know, saying you can't parent effectively if you're not considered a friend by your child, if they don't see you, um, you know, as, a, as someone they're close to and someone they elect to spend time with. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I, I'm cautious of falling into the permissive parent trap where you're only a friend, where you're afraid of setting a limit or of mm. saying no, because I think that that's a responsibility we have to our children as the adults who are stronger, wiser, older, bigger. We just have access to information that they don't have mm. um, at times. And I think, you know, it's, it's easy when it comes to safety, right? We all know that it's our responsibility to buckle their seatbelt in in the car we all know it's our responsibility you know to keep to baby proof the house but i think equally uh it's our responsibility to set those type of limits in the emotional realm in the educational realm in etc etc in other words i think as unschoolers or as peaceful parents if we let our kids grow up without basic manners uh without um without knowing how to read and write without basic skills um, without knowing how to maintain a, a, a healthy relationship and a healthy body. And, you know, just really the basics of being a good person and living a good life. 
the way we define it, right? We only have our own def definition. Then I think that we're also being negligent. So I think that we have to both be their friend and also be their guide, if you like. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes I think of it as if I was dropped into a completely strange country right now where I didn't speak the language and I didn't know the culture and I didn't know the laws and the customs and the norms. Um, but I had this really amazing guide by my side mm. who was able to, you know, just point out the pitfalls, help me read a map, uh, translate some things for me, right? So, no, our kids are not in a foreign land. They are entrenched in our culture. They're not aliens. But in many <laughs> respects... Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> I don't know about your kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm saying, look... I, I, in many respects, we need to we need to hold their hand and, and teach them things and show them things and guide them. Now, having said all of that, the flip side to that is that I consider my kids my greatest teachers. Um, there is so much more raising of me <laughs> than there is of them mm. <laughs> going on in this equation, mm -hmm. right? I need to raise myself so much more than I need to raise them. That's like if I had to divide the parenting pie into how much of the focus needs to be on me and how much of the focus needs to be on them in terms of molding and shaping and, and self-work, I take 90%. I take the lion's share. Um, because at the end of the day, it's really all about my levels of awareness and consciousness uh, and mindfulness that need to come into play in our relationship much more than, you know, they're going to learn. They're here. They're going to learn. But what will they learn is... You know, I'm I'm the one exposing them to, mm. to that, right? So every time I yell and every time I get aggressive and every time I lose it, I'm teaching them. I'm teaching them very effectively, right? So I think that at the end of the day, in that sense, they're the teachers because they, they are bringing to my awareness in a very active way uh, all the things in me that I need to resolve. Yeah, and, and I think uh, one... one uh... Uh, phrase that comes to mind is basically be the example of the parent or or the adult that you want them to be right you act the way you yeah. want them to act right uh, because they listen more to actions than they do to words <laughs> you know the horrible 100%. the worst the worst uh, advice that a parent can say is you know do as i say not as i do <laughs> right yeah Complete, right. completely that contradictory. just never happens yeah yeah go ahead go ahead yeah, no, 100%. I agree. I think uh, I think you have to be the example. Um, and I think it goes even bigger than just being the example outwardly. I really believe that what we do on every level, like you said, how you treat a business, how you treat other people, mm. you know, it's not enough to be a peaceful parent with your kid. Right. Uh, you, you, you work on you. You get to where you want to be in terms of your health. Are you consuming junk food? Are you consuming the screen too much? Mm -hmm. You know, are you um, being disrespectful? Are you uh, not cleaning up your own messes or mm. getting places on time or learning things you need to be learning? Well, you know, how about you? So when you're all sorted out, then, uh, you know, then you can start picking on your kids. Not getting places on time. You know me too well. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, but, but yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's so important to, uh, you know, to... To really focus on ourselves, you're right. And and one one thing that came to mind was when people say, you know, how are you going to socialize your kids if you don't send them to school, right? They're not going to learn how to socialize with other people. And the same exact way, they see how you interact with other people, and that's how they learn. And so, you know, I see my kids, um, you know, because, you know, every time I meet somebody, I... Um, you know, I like to talk to people and ask them questions. And some people say too many questions. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an inquisitive never. person. What can I say? <laughs> so <laughs> I know, I know you would never complain about that. But anyway, so yeah, so people say that to me. And, uh, but my kids have no fear, like as with authority, like they go up to adults and they talk to them basically as, as equals. And they say, my name is Marcus. I'm a six years old. That's my sister, Serena. And, <laughs> And 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 so so many times I've seen other kids that are that are very timid and quiet and um and it, and I think to myself like what what must the home be like if this child is like that you know and it kind of scares me you know or especially when kids are so obedient like parents says sit there be quiet and and the child sits there for like I don't know twenty minutes 
you know, and no child like four or five years old should <laughs> should be sitting quietly for like 20 minutes as they're told, you know, it's just children don't do that. Right. Um, and so it, it, it kind of scares me when they do. But um, but yeah, so so socialization, that's that's it's just it's just completely ridiculous. <laughs> like if they just see you interacting that, you know, they learn, they learn. I, I had a great quote about socialization, which was, um, you know, the. Who are the people least qualified to teach an eight-year-old boy how to be- become a man? Other eight-year-old Other eight-year boys. boys yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't stick him in a room with all the eight-year-old boys. Right. Show him, you know. Show- <laughs> yeah, I think we miss out a lot on socialization in schools. Uh, where you know, I I I signed my kids up for a preschool this year, and I um they didn't end up going. But um, when I came, they were like, well, this is the older twos and this is the younger twos. <laughs> and I was like, what, you're separating older twos from younger twos? God forbid that the older twos should have to wait a little bit to right. accommodate the younger twos' right. needs. Right. And God forbid that the younger twos should learn from older twos, you know, not to mention learn from 16-year-olds. Like, it was just, you know, I just, it was, it was a shame. I was like, oh, they're missing out, you know? Yeah, we, we hang out with a bunch of homeschooling families and they people who are just generally critical of the schooling system you know some of them sent to waldorf school montessori school you mm-hmm. know different things like that um and so there's a wide range of kids you know from like nine years old all the way down to like uh you know one and a half or two and i love it it's awesome my daughter who yeah. just turned uh, she's gonna turn four in august uh you know there's not too many girls in the group so the nine-year-old girl immediately connected with my daughter my daughter loves her and and she's always like you know and, and the daughter the older daughter she she was kind of left out because there's not not many older kids but she loves my daughter and she, and they're always hanging out together holding hands and my daughter wants wants her, her wants her to pick her up and i i love i love the idea of kids just playing by themselves as much as they want to but i think that they should have access to an adult social group Hmm. um i think it's a big loss in how we live today you know very just like isolated in our homes and then you know you go to work go to school come back and you don't just have that kind of clan um which is i think how humans were kind of wired Hmm. uh, in a hunter-gatherer setting um yeah i think it's a big loss yeah yeah one thing i wanted to point out um also is is um the idea that um it's not really about what we teach our kids. Um, this is my this is my bent on on unschooling. It's, yeah, it's everyone's like, well, what if they don't learn math and history and chemistry and science and biology? What if they don't learn that? And for me, the focus is not on the knowledge, the particular bits of knowledge. That's not what's important to me. For me, what's mm-hmm. important is to maintain a fascination and a curiosity in life. That's what's important. A love for learning. Uh, you know, self motivation, self direction, auto being an autodidact. Because if you have that, if you have self motivation, you don't need somebody behind your back with a whip, you know, saying, "Read the book, read the book." <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, you're gonna take a test, or if you don't do that, you're gonna be punished. You know, you don't need that. You know, you you can you're you're self educated, and you know the possibilities just open up so much more. And so that's what that's what I strive as well as um. You know, in addition to maintaining and developing uh, a, a strong bond between me and my children of trust that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that if they have any problems in life, that they would trust you enough to come to you first because they yeah. want, because they look out, for, because they trust uh, in your knowledge and your insight and your experience, right? And and so, and, and if they don't, if they, fe- if they fear you or if they want to hide things from you, they're just going to find someone else. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a great, there's a great point. It's very difficult to protect a trust between a parent and child whilst you are, you know, forcing them or subjecting them to, to punishments, right. uh, to coercions, to rewards. Um, all of that stuff is, yeah, I think it really erodes trust. I definitely think so. And I think even as peaceful parents, we probably, you know, we have, you got, you got to work, you got to work double time. Uh, to to prove to your kids again and again that you're in their corner. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you, yeah. You know it's so beautiful when when your children, for no particular reason, out of the blue, you didn't ask, they just come up to you and say, "I love you, I like you." Aww, <laughs> and, 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 the I, best. I, I know, I know, it happens <laughs> to you, right? 
and, and, it's, and it's and it's like you're not even expecting it and and, and my sister, my daughter she just comes up to me and she hugs me i love you daddy i'm like oh my god one of my favorite things to do <laughs> with my with my son and he just he's this kind of kid he likes to have these kind of conversations but you know especially like when i'm snuggling with him in bed and i'm just tucking him in and everyone's calm and at the end of the day and sometimes i'll say to him something like you know i want you to know that the most important job that I have, the most important thing to me is to be a good mom to you. So will you just tell me if you think I'm, I'm not doing it right? right you know, right. Um, you know, I really, I really want to get that job right. I really hope that when you're grown up, you'll look back and say, my mom was a great mom. <laughs> uh, that's that's right. really what I'm hoping you'll say that, you know, that will be it for me. Um, and, you know, and, and so I try to get that feedback from him starting from now you know and sometimes he'll say to me he'll he'll usually he says you know yes you're a great mom and it's wonderful and sometimes he'll be like you know you're a great mom but this morning you weren't such a great mom oh, <laughs> and he'll explain man. to me why you know i didn't like you so sometimes it's like oh you didn't let me watch tv or something and i'll be like yes yeah, you know part of my job as a mom is to yeah. keep you safe and healthy and sometimes i have to say no but sometimes he'll say things like you you didn't speak to me respectfully oh, and i'll be like you're right wow. you're right thank yeah. you for pointing that out i i'm going to work on that um and what i what i love about this kind of candidness this kind of equality you know even though i don't see it as a fully equal relationship but as much as possible yeah. is that he'll often critique me in that way and in the way that i have spoken to him you know it's 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 really the best apropos modeling you know and being the example it's really the best uh, you know proof in the pudding when he will turn around to me and be like something like uh you know he'll say i don't i don't like how you're expressing that can you ask me nicer or um or he'll say i don't feel respected right now or he'll say it's my body so it's my decision um, and kind of, you know, sentences that he's heard me say to him or about him. And then he'll say it back uh, to me, which is, um, which is really great. Because <laughs> he puts me in my place and I appreciate that. You know, Abitel, this is, I think this is the second or third time that I have cried a little bit during an interview because it's so Aww. beautiful. <laughs> because, you know, I, and, and you know what? I've interviewed many people on various different topics but only on you know people who do the peaceful parenting and unschooling the way they describe their relationship with their kids it's just i don't know it just gets to me <laughs> it's like it's like how yeah. many how much time would pass before you know a, an authoritarian parent would ever ask their children how am i doing you know for feedback how how much time has to pass right right and right. And, and it's so sad and and to me it demonstrates um you know an insecurity and a lack of humility in that they 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 really don't know what they're doing but they're putting up this false veneer that they do and they don't want to show their weakness right nobody right. wants to show their weakness <laughs> You know, I learned from Brene Brown primarily, who's a vulnerability researcher, uh, that the biggest strength is in being able to be vulnerable. And I really remember that. I carry that with me very, um, you know, forcefully because I feel like that is true bravery. True bravery is showing how vulnerable you are and exposing that vulnerability. And it's always always, always, always more effective in a relationship when you're able to expose that vulnerability because almost all anger, I think all anger, right? I, I think of anger as the most kind of corrosive of, of, mm. of emotions within a relationship. And because when we're angry, we get defensive and we get offensive. So we attack and we defend. And it's just so pointless because at the end of the day, we all just want to feel worthy, worthy of unconditional love. That's that's the bottom line here. You know, that's why kids are acting out. That's why parents are acting out. We all just want to know that we're okay, mm. that we're worthy of, of some love. And I feel like if you can cut through that anger, if you can say, oh, you know what? I'm getting really angry. I'm getting triggered. I'm getting defensive or I'm, get, I'm attacking you. But really, the reason is because I feel vulnerable. Really, the reason is because I don't know what I'm doing or because I feel uh, worried that I'm doing, doing the wrong thing, et cetera, et cetera. Really, you can expose that vulnerability um, even to very young children, I have found it's such a um, it's like uh, a, like a like a magic bullet. You know, it just propels you to the next level in the relationship where you don't get stuck in that power struggle. You kind of cut through that clutter and you get to the real, you know, 
the real connection, mm-hmm. um, the root of what's going on. And sometimes like if me and my son Eli will get into some kind of power struggle or I'll be telling him and he'll be telling me, and, oh, you're such a mean mommy. Oh, well, you, you drive me crazy. And then I'll just be like, you know, Eli, I'm just talking in such a rude way to you. And the truth is I'm exhausted. And that's my fault because I went to bed too late last night. I know I have a baby who wakes me up and I still went to bed late. And I'm feeling like... A mess up because the house is such a mess and that's gross for me and I I don't have the patience or the time to tidy it enough and you're telling me you don't want to do something that's so important to me and I'm having trouble letting go of that I'm trouble I'm having trouble letting go of my agenda for you right now and then I say all of that and I know that so many people will tell me hey that's too many words for a four-year-old you're being too wordy you're explaining too much <laughs> but if he turns around to me and says I know, mommy, you're having a hard day. It's really my fault. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. And I should have just helped you clean up the Lego. I'm sorry. And then we have a big hug. Wow. <laughs> then I know that it's okay. It wasn't too many words. You know what I mean? <laughs> you get it. Right. So, yeah. So I think vulnerability is the biggest bravery for us as parents. And I just want to touch on one more thing. You said about authoritarian parents, how, many, how much time would pass for them to say that kind of thing. I once wrote a wonderful blog post, a very famous blog post. It, you know, it's, it's got millions and millions of hits. You'll, you'll find it easily about, um, I think it was five deathbed regrets. It was a woman who works with people on their deathbed and mm. she f- saw a common, common theme that keeps coming up. Um, and... I often think about that post and about people's regrets about their relationships and about not being vulnerable enough or not taking chances or not being brave enough to be their their true selves. And I I kind of think about that on a daily level because I'm a bit of a morbid person. I um, (laughs) I. I'm a morbid person. Yeah, I kind I of never, think... Of, I never would think of that of you. <laughs> <laughs> to say. Well, I'm morbid in the sense that I'm very aware of my own mortality ah, and everyone else's mortality. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I'm very aware that any interaction or any day might be my last. Uh-huh. Um, so that gives me kind of a good energy of like being like, okay, let's make it work. You know, mm. um, this is what I'm going to be remembered for. Uh, I often have the narrative in my head that I might die before my kids grow up. And oh I'm my like, what? God. And <laughs> really? Listen, I hope it won't happen. Right? Oh. But it's just, it's a thought that helps me. It helps me because I often think like, okay, what memory of their mom will they have? Like what energy will they take with it? You know, like what, what will their early childhood experience give them in their life? And, when I think about it that way, then I'm able to make each day count better, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so so with the regrets, I think that it's really important not to reach the end of our parenting lives, you know, not to reach our deathbeds and then look back and be like, oh, baby, I wish I was kinder to you or mm-hmm. I wish I was more connected to you or I right. wish I spent more time with you, right? But to be brave in the moment with all the challenges, the financial challenges, the emotional challenges, all of that, a lot of people, when I tell them I'm homeschooling, they say, I could never do that. And it's true. Many people perhaps couldn't. But if, if you know, I really wish I could say to them, this is kind of what I wish I could say, was like, you could. You could if you wanted to. And you can open your mind to that option in case you want to. It's not for everyone, but in case you want to, don't let it slip by you with the idea of I could never, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, awesome points. <laughs> I did not know about that. <laughs> that you think about your mortality, um, but uh, yeah, I can see how that would, um, you know, give you impetus to, uh, you know, constantly improve yourself and strive for excellence, which is wonderful. Um, <clears throat> you know, the way I think about it is, uh, you know, because my wife constantly asks me, "Why are you doing this podcast and this YouTube channel and this website? It's not making us any money. What are you doing it for?" It's not for the family. <laughs> right. And 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 the way I look at it is this is my way of improving the world, of educate of providing education, giving my thoughts, sharing my thoughts, and also um providing a testimony or chronicling my thoughts. Mm-hmm. It's like a snapshot of how I think yep. now. So that um, you know, when my kids are older, they can, you know, look back and how was he at that time, you know, and was he right. in- inconsistent? Was he, did he constantly change his view? And, you know, and, and I think that's a, I think that's helpful, right? To, for, for kids to right. see that. So, um, Great resource. 
Totally. Yeah, it's a great resource, and and I think it, um, I think it compels us to be more consistent um, in right. our own thoughts and, and and strive to be um, you know more rational, more more compassionate. And so uh, yeah, so I feel like you know you're doing a wonderful thing with your channel, educating people. You know, uh, like like you said, I think I think you said in another interview that one of the reasons you made the channel was because you were you kept finding yourself explaining over and over and over again. You know your yeah. philosophy, and you're like. Yeah. You're like, I just I just told the last person. Can you just talk to them, please? I don't want to explain this again. <laughs> just call that person. So So yes, if you make these short videos and uh, actually now I'm starting to make short videos by the way. So because <laughs> okay. I recognize some people I recognize some people don't want to watch 1 hour or hour and 15 minute videos, which is fine. Yeah. Um, you know, short attention span and everything. But uh, <laughs> but uh so yeah, so it's a wonderful thing to uh to just increase the education, you know, put more knowledge out there. How can you how can that be a bad Thing. It can't be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And you know what? Um, that quote that they say, you teach what you most need to learn, um, that really guides me in, wow. in creating content because I really feel like I want to put this out there. And my most fulfilling moments, apart from the moments with my kids, like in my work, my most fulfilling moments is when I'll have a real heart to heart with another parent and we'll move to another level. Like they'll be like, oh yeah. And they'll come away feeling like refreshed and like there's a new direction that they could try with their kids and that they could feel better about it or whatever. Like, you know, just spotlighting, giving insight. But um, I think the real reason that I started a YouTube channel, to be honest, is to out myself in a way, like to be like, to come out of the closet and be like, hey, you know what? This is actually what's in my mind. This is actually what I'm thinking, to be honest. And um, and to hold myself accountable, because now that I'm a parenting vlogger, um, <laughs> you know, I need to I I I need to live up to what I'm what I'm talking about. And I don't always. But but it's my it's it, it really it really it really makes me feel like I have to be a lot more accountable. So I I, I try um, and I have this kind of image in my head, two images which are which scare the living daylights out. Wait, wait, wait. One do, is, do they have to do a death? No. Sorry? Do they have to do a death? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm trying to make sure. <laughs> All right. We got, the, we got the death out of the way. All right, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. One is someone will, like, wire up my house with spy cameras, and they will see how I really parent some of the time. Really? And they'll be like, <laughs> yeah, they'll be like, oh, my God, she's such a hypocrite. She's a fake. <laughs> the listener. She's such a fake. Unsubscribe. <laughs> I saw her yelling. I saw her slamming the door. Thumbs down. Thumbs um, down. <laughs> that's one fear. Um, and the second fear is that my kids will grow up. And they'll like go on social media of, you know, 2030, whatever that will look like. And right. they'll be like, she was awful. <laughs> or, you know, she's not the parenting junkie. She's the parenting junk. And, you know, I don't know, whatever they're going to say. <laughs> oh, I just made that up, but that's pretty good, right? I hope they use that. <laughs> Maybe. I have to say, when I first heard the name of your of your uh, channel, I didn't really I didn't really understand. I could it, it's not obvious to me what it's about. And I don't know if you did that intentionally, but I'm like parenting junkie. She's addicted to parent. Is that good? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So it, it, it's open for interpretation, right? <laughs> <laughs> they yeah, ha they have I to look through your it, videos. It's, it's missing the peaceful parenting element, which is a shame in a way. Like I would like people to know that straight away, hmm. but. Um, I wanted to leave it open enough. Uh, you know, when I started The Parenting Junkie, I wasn't homeschooling, for example. And suddenly that's a big part of it. Like, I wanted to leave it opening enough. It's basically just I'm addicted to learning and I'm, I have a, a mild obsession with parenting, with mm. all things that are related to the parent-child relationship, um, you know, from diapering through school. So I, wanna, I wanted to allow myself to touch on all of those topics. So, so you mentioned two things. So one with the cameras and, and, and looking if you... Oh, yeah, and the other one was in the, the 2030... Uh, uh, what do you call it? The yes, that yeah. my kids will come back and tell the world that right. I was not a good parent. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> so, so do you want to wrap up and um, and just share how people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about your work? Sure, absolutely. Well, they can email me at avital a v i t a l at theparentingjunkie dot com. The parenting junkie junkie is j u n k i e. Um, and uh, probably best is on YouTube or Facebook um, or on my website, which is theparentingjunkie.com. You can just go to the contact uh, area there. 
Uh, and I would love to hear from people. Absolutely. I love to gather ideas for my upcoming videos. So please send them, send them in. And self-promotion, uh, I'm going to put a big fat plug for my upcoming uh, course, which I'm really excited to publish, which is all about setting empathic limits. So I am an unschooler. I am a peaceful parent. I do believe in setting limits and finding that that you know, zone that is not punitive and not permissive. Um, but how we do that is such is, you know, is so beyond us because none of us have seen it done. We were mostly raised by authoritarian parents and some of us by permissive parents, but we didn't see pe parents who were able to set limits in a healthy way, but not, um, not without empathy and kindness. So that's something that I'm really excited to launch pretty soon, hopefully uh, September. Great. So everyone, please check out her uh, YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anywhere you can find her, her website, theparentingjunkie.com. Check her out. She's putting out some awesome content. Wonderful person. Please like and share and subscribe her videos. Thank you so <laughs> much, Janela, for having me on. It's been such no, a pleasure to chat about this. No and problem. Hopefully many, many more conversations to come. Yes, we will We will get, a, get you back on. I'm sure there's more to tell. So, uh, so, so thank you, everyone, for listening. This is Peace for Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, theconsciousresistance.com, and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.